Well, hello, 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 everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Face-to-Face -face Conversations with God. It's your girl, Chantel, and it's time for us to jump in and read the word of the Lord together. You guys, it's our one-year anniversary. We have been online reading the word for a year. We have covered 52 books. The other day, I thought we had covered 53, but we've covered 52 books of the Bible. There's only 66 to go. I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> not to go. There's only 66 in total. So we have been plowing through the word of the Lord together, and it has been a beautiful thing. So I am so grateful to be on with you all tonight. So now we're uh, going to go ahead and um, invite uh, the, the broadcast with other platforms so that others can join in with us. Give me a moment to invite people from the other platform. All right, watch party. Welcome, welcome, welcome to those that may be just signing in. All I'm doing is I'm uh, starting a watch party so that others can join. And I'm starting uh, so that I can throw it out there for other people to see where we are and to join in with us. You can do a watch party also. All you have to do is just hit the share button. And when you hit the share button, you'll see um, some other buttons come up. And you'll see watch party. You just go out there and do a watch party and you can invite your family and your friends and everybody can watch at the same time and comment and uh, just learn together. All right. So that's what I'm doing right now. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Uh, Whoops, that's if I spell it right. Okay. All right, we're ready to go. All right. So now as that's spooling up, Okay, that's spooling in. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome to Face-to-Face -face Conversations with God as we journey through the word of the Lord together. We are going to be reading, uh, starting 2 Corinthians. Uh, we just finished 1 Corinthians last night. We're starting 2 Corinthians. We're going to be reading uh, 2 Corinthians chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. We are so grateful to be on with you again tonight. I'm so excited that it's our one year anniversary. I started this a year ago and I had on the same top and I decided, well, why don't I just put on that same top again tonight? Just, I'm just so grateful. You know, it's very difficult to start a thing and actually see it to its completion. We're almost done. You probably didn't think that you would be able to read the Bible in its entirety. And you've been doing that. You've learned some things. You've been convicted. You've been encouraged. You've been pruned. <laughs> God is watering. God is refreshing. God is restoring. So it's such a blessing to be on here with you all as we read the word of the Lord together. So we're going to go ahead and get started. We are reading uh, 2 Corinthians, and we are going to be reading chapters 1 through 4. And you know how I always do when we start a new, uh, a new uh, book, I always give you an overview of what's going on in this book. So 
as we know, we're still uh, hearing from uh, Apostle Paul as he was sending letters to the uh, church in Corinth. And as we stated when we first started reading the book of Corinthians, you have to remember the mindset of the people that were in the city of Corinth. Corinth was not far from Athens. Um, so you have to understand the Greek mythology that was going on in that city. You have to understand how it was clashing with, uh, with the teaching of, of, uh, uh, the, uh, of Christ. You have to understand how uh, they were trying to mix the two together. You have to understand that it was a very metropolitan city. So that means there was a lot of money coming in and out of that city, a lot of influence, a lot of wealth. And there was a lot of people coming from different places with different ideas and had never heard of Christ before. So there's a lot going on in this city. And Paul is not there right now. He started a church there, but he's not there right now. And he's heard that the city, uh, the church was doing some wild and crazy things. So as you notice in the first book of Corinthians, he was covering a lot of doctrinal issues, meaning he was covering things that line up with the doctrine of Christ. In second Corinthians, we're going to see more of the, um, the the person of Paul. Now he's still correcting the uh, Church of Corinth, but he's doing it with a different um, with a different uh, angle. He the first letter of Corinthians, you notice he was a little harsh. He was just kind of curt, you know. But second Corinthians, he like look here, I ain't playing with y'all. Y'all need to get it together. <laughs> You know how it is. You know, the first time someone tells you, hey, you know, that's not the right way to do things. You know, maybe you should uh, look at the, the policies and procedures so that you don't mess up on the next go around. And, you know, those know-it-alls that are like, I don't need to read the policies and procedures. Well, that's how we act. We act like we don't need to read God's policies and procedures. <laughs> so Paul is coming back and he has just a little bit more fire in him this time because he's like look i need y'all to get it all right and then you're gonna see the humanity of paul so i love it because so many times when we read um we see these apostles that were in the bible and we think that oh they didn't suffer the way we suffered and they didn't feel things the way we feel them we're gonna see there are things that go on in the lives of people that you call giants that are just like what go on in your life. The only difference between you and them is they carry that stuff to God because they know they cannot handle it. They can't change it. They can't uh, uh, restructure it. They have to take it to God and let him allow his will to be manifested in their lives. And one thing that I love about this book, we're going to see God never discloses to us what the thorn is that was bothering Paul. And God never did tell us that he healed him from that thing or delivered him from that thing. There may be some things in our lives that we carry with us for the rest of our lives. It's not that God can't do it. It's not that God won't do it. For whatever reason, he chose not to disclose to us if he ever delivered Paul or healed Paul or fixed whatever this thorn was. But there was something that Paul learned while he uh, dealt with this issue. It's the same thing that you and I have to do. There are We have to come at peace with some issues that are in our lives. All right? Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Oh, I thought I was cold, but I think I'm hot. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, we are going to pray first, like we always do, and then we're going to give you an overview of 2 Corinthians, and then we're going to start reading 2 Corinthians chapters 1 through 4 
from the Living Bible, all right? Okay. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you and to read your word together. We thank you that you are writing your word on the tables of our heart. We thank you, Lord God, that you are causing our eyes to be open. We thank you, Lord God, that as we read your word, we are no longer blinded to its truths. We are no longer blinded to its uh, oh, it's it's healing, it's nurturing, it's comforting, it's correcting. We are no longer blinded. You are causing us to see, see past our own understanding, see past our own experiences, see past our own ways of thinking. We're learning how to see past the way we want you to handle it. And we're learning how to actually grab a hold to your will and walk it out in our lives. We thank you for this, Lord God. We thank you that you're opening up our ears and we're able to hear your direction, your instruction, your correction, your encouragement. Ah, we're able to hear you and a stranger, a strange instruction a strange voice, a strange idea. We don't even hear it. You're causing us to be so fine tuned to your voice. We don't even, we can't, we can't even fathom following the instruction of the enemy anymore. We don't even have a desire to do that because you are showing us how much you love us, how much you protect us, how much you provide for us, and how much you care for us. We thank you that at one time, we really couldn't hear that, but now we hear it. Glory to God. We understand that you are not trying to keep us in a place of shame or condemnation, but you're bringing us to a place of freedom and liberty in Christ. We thank you for that, Lord God. We thank you for Holy Spirit, for Holy Spirit, you are the spirit of truth. You are the one who reveals God. You reveal the mysteries of God. You reveal the mysteries of Christ. You reveal the salvation of Christ, my God. You even reveal yourself to us and a need for us to invite you into our daily lives. Holy Spirit, you are the spirit of truth where we have operated in error, where we have operated in myths, where we have operated in wise tales, you are letting us know that has no power. And you are showing us the truth of the word of God and the power of truth. Ha! Ah, the freedom of truth. Glory, God. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Hallelujah. We thank you for it, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for what you're teaching us. You're causing us to come up higher. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb of God. We thank you for this, Father. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, guys. Um, I can't figure out if I'm hot or if I'm cold, so I guess I'm just going to keep this on, and I guess that I will figure it out in a minute. All right, so for those that are just joining us, we are just getting ready to start uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And like I said, whenever we start a new chapter, we always want to give you an overview of what's going on. Now, remember, this is not a Bible study. What was the purpose of this when we first started this one year ago? It was to read the Bible. Why? Because there are so many people who I had come across just in conversation that it told me they had never read the Bible in its entirety. And they told me that they were believers. And my thought was, how on earth can you say you know God, but you've never had a conversation with them as far as reading the word? This is how he talks to us. This is how he instructs us. This is how he corrects us. This is how he encourages us. This is how he builds us. He proves us in the word. My God, you find strength in the word. That's why so many people, they don't see the victories that they want to see because they really don't know how God operates. 
all right? So it is very important. If this is your first time joining us, go to the page, follow the page. You can go all the way back to when we first started and you can listen. We only read four chapters a day, sometimes three. And if the way a chapter or a book ends up, sometimes five. Like yesterday, we read five chapters. But go back and listen. Well, we even read, look, we got to go and do numbers and we even have to do Leviticus. Lord Jesus, when we get to numbers, oh my gosh. It's, you know, a lot of people avoid numbers, but numbers shows you the detail of God. God is so detailed in every facet of our lives. My God. All right. So for those of you all that thought that you would never be able to read the Bible in its entirety, well, if you just follow our plan, you will see that you'll be able to do that. Okay. All right. So here we go. First, uh, second Corinthians overview. Uh, in first Corinthians, Paul was addressing some serious issues. The church of Corinth was having, and we discussed that a few moments ago. There was a lot of things going on in the church of Corinth. There was a lot of things that shouldn't have been happening inside of the church. And Paul was addressing that in the letters. The first letter letter, it was a little curt. It was a little tart. It was a little harsh. But Paul was like, hey, this is not how we do things. This is how, that may have been how you did it in the world. But as you come into Christ, everything lines up to Christ. Not to a man, not to a woman, not to your ideas, but we all line up with Christ. We are one body. We don't break Christ apart because we're all in different denominations. We are one body serving Christ. All right? And he also reminded us that we are to do everything in love. And everything that we do, we are to glorify God and we are to do it in love. And then uh, the second letter, we see more of Paul's emotions come through. We won't see him cover as many doctrinal issues as he covered in the first letter, but we will see and hear and get an impartation of what Paul saw in the third heaven. My God. And we will see that Paul had an issue that plagued him and God did not. He didn't expose it to us. He didn't write it in the word whether or not he delivered him or not. To sum up 2 Corinthians, Paul expressed this main thing to Corinth, always be faithful to Christ. He didn't say be faithful to a man or a woman. We do that because we honor people, but our faithfulness is unto Christ. You follow people as they follow Christ. When they start following their own ways, child exit stage left, and going about your business. If you're on here with me and I start teaching something that's crazy, don't come back on. If it's not lining up with the word, you have every right not to follow a person, okay? It says, always be faithful to Christ. We are faithful to a lot of things. We are faithful to a lot of people. But are you faithful to Christ? All right. Okay. So we're going to get started with 2 Corinthians chapter 1. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This is the second letter Paul has sent to the city of Corinth, the church of Corinth. Dear friends, this letter is from me, Paul, appointed by God to be Jesus Christ's messenger. And from our dear brother, Timothy, we are writing to you all uh, of, I'm sorry, we are writing to all of you believers there in Corinth throughout Greece. May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ mightily bless each one of you and give you peace. What a wonderful God we have. He is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this. 
I love this. And I wrote this in the description. He is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of every mercy. Now, have you ever stopped? You know, we, we read the word mercy. And we go, okay, I have an idea of what mercy means. But look at what mercy means. Mercy is compassion, forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. So how can we read this? God is the source of every mercy. God is the source of every compassion. God is the source of forgiveness. God is the source of leniency. God is the source of clemency. God is the source of grace. God is the source of charity, love. God is the source of forbearance. God is the source of humanity. That's what mercy is. That's what God gives us every day. He gives us the source of mercy. My God. And the one who so wonderfully comforts and strengthens us in our hardships and trials. When you are down and out and you are going through a trial or a hardship, it's God who strengthens you to make it through that thing. You are being carried by his might, by his strength. You're not in it alone, all right? And why does he do this? So that when others are troubled, needing our sympathy and encouragement, we can pass on to them the same help and comfort God has given us. <sighs> you remember that scripture where it says every morning you wake up and goodness and mercy, goodness and mercy, goodness and mercy are there. The two twins are there. Every day, God extends mercy to you and I. Every day, God extends forgiveness to you and I. Every day, God extends leniency to you and I. And he's saying that same thing that I do, the same way I comfort you, you comfort others. Ooh, we, we ain't been doing this one too well. <laughs> you can be sure that the more we undergo sufferings for Christ, the more he will shower us with his comfort and encouragement. So the more he showers us, the more we should shower others. We got some growing to do in this, all of us. You know, you may be operating in this, but there's even more because the more grace and the more mercy God shows you, the more you show it to others, the more encouragement and comfort and peace and grace you show to others. We are in deep trouble for bringing you God's comfort and salvation. But in our trouble, God has comforted us. And this too, to help you, to show you from our personal experience how God will tenderly comfort you when you undergo these same sufferings. He will give you the strength to endure. That's good, God. That's good. I think you ought to know, dear brothers, about the hard time we went through in Asia. We were really crushed and overwhelmed. How many times do you hear a leader, a prominent leader say, you know what? This thing almost took me out. I was crushed behind it. I was overwhelmed. But listen how Paul talks. That makes it so much more attainable for those who are following him. He's like, what? He was crushed, overwhelmed, and he feared he would never live through it. We don't hear people talking like that. The more truthful we are to say, look, there are times when it, this stuff gets heavy on me too, but I go to God and he strengthens me and he comforts me. See that? I love this. It shows us that Paul was human just like you and I. God used him just like he can use you and I. My God. We felt we were doomed to die and saw how powerless we were to help ourselves. 
but that was good. For then we put everything into the hands of God. We alone, who alone, I'm sorry, we put everything into the hands of God, who alone could save us. For he can even raise the dead. And he did help us and save us from this terrible death. Yes, and we expected him or we expect him to do it again and again. So Paul is stating, it doesn't matter what I have to face. I am going to bring the gospel to the people. No matter how much hurt or harm can come my way. No matter how overwhelmed, no matter how crushed I feel, no matter if I feel like I'm not going to make it through, I'm still going to bring forth the gospel because if God can raise Christ from the dead, surely he can comfort and save and, and protect me. That's what he's saying. But you must help us too by praying for us. For much thanks and praise will go to God from you who see his wonderful answers to your prayers for our safety. We are so glad that we can say with utter honesty that in all our dealings, we have been pure and sincere, quietly depending upon the Lord for his help and not on our own skills. Now that right there, how many times do we get ourselves in a fix and we go and manipulate stuff? We go and fix it ourselves and then we end up making a worse mess than we originally had. This is what Paul is, is stressing to the people. It was with the Lord's help and not our own skills that we were able to maneuver through all of these trials and tribulation and circumstances that we faced. All right? Look, many of us can just go in our mind's eye and see how many times, instead of going to God and asking God, show us how to get out of this or show us the answer or show us what we should do, we try to fix it ourselves. And it got worse. All right. And that is even more true, if possible, about the way we have acted towards you. Verse 13. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, verse 13. My letters have been straightforward and sincere. Nothing is written between the lines. What Paul is saying, I speak what I'm saying, I'm not trying to have any hidden subliminal messages. I make it very plain. It's either do this or don't do that. Go here and not there. See that? Nothing hidden. And even though you don't know me very well, I hope someday you will, I want you to try to accept me and be proud of me as you already are to some extent, just as I shall be of you the day when our Lord Jesus comes back again. Verse 15, it was because I was so sure of your understanding and trust that I planned to stop and see you on my way to Macedonia, as well as afterwards when I returned so that I could do a double blessing to you so that you could send me on my way to Judea or Judah. Then why, you may be asking, did I change my plan? Hadn't I really made up my mind yet? Or am I like a man of the world who says yes when he really means no? Never, as surely as God is true, I am not that sort of a person. My yes means yes, period. Look, can we get to that point where our word is something that people can actually stand on? If you say you're going to do a thing, then you do it. If you can't do it, then be honest with people and just let them know you can't do it. All right? Verse 19. 
Timothy and Salvanius and I have been telling you about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He isn't one to say yes when he means no. He always does exactly what he says. He carries out and fulfills all of God's promises, no matter how many of them there are. And we have told everyone how faithful he is, giving glory to his name. That's probably the problem that we have with following Christ. Because our words are not sure, we say yes when we really mean no. And it, it, you think that, okay, well, some of the things that God says, well, maybe he'll do them and maybe he won't. Because that's how you act in your life. But let your words be sure, all right? Let your words be sure. If you can't do a thing, just tell the people you can't do it. Let your yeas be yeas and your nays be nays. That's how, it is. That's how it's worded in the uh, King James. That's how many of you are used to it, all right? Verse 21, it is this God who has made you and me into faithful believers and commissioned us apostles to preach the good news. He has put his brand upon us, his mark of ownership, and given us his Holy Spirit in, the heart, in our hearts as guarantee that we belong to him and at the first installment of all that he is going to give us. I call upon this God to witness against me if I am not telling the absolute truth, the reason I haven't come to visit you yet is that I don't want to sadden you with a severe rebuke. When I come, although I can't do much to help your faith, for it is, a, for it is strong already, I want to be able to do something about your joy. I want to make you happy, not sad. First Corinthians, uh, Second Corinthians chapter two. No, I said to myself, I won't do it. I'll not make them unhappy with another painful visit. For if I make you sad, who's going to make me happy? You are the ones to do it. And how can you if I cause you pain? Now listen to this. This is something that you can apply to your everyday living. Husbands and wives, you come home, and instead of making the household happy, the children groan whenever they hear the key in the door because they know as soon as you come in, it's just going to be some chaos, and you're not going to bring pleasantness and peace to the house. Husband, you come in angry. You upset the wife. The wife upsets the kids, and now there's no peace in the home. Wife. You come in angry, you upset the husband, the husband upsets the kids, and there's no peace in that home. How can you expect there to be peace if you're always bringing in sadness? All right? Let's, let's let God work on that part of us. All right? We shouldn't be nice at the office only. <laughs> There should be a peace. How is it that you can be nice to everybody in the office, but you can't be nice to your own family? How is it that you can always call upon your family for help, but you never call them when you don't need their help? Come on, you see this? People don't want to, they see your number, they're like, oh man. They gonna ask me for something. They gonna ask me to do something. They just never call me whenever they just wanted to say, hey, how you doing? See that? So, you know, yes, he's talking about a group of people, but let's bring this thing in and say, okay, God, how do I apply this to my everyday living? He says, you are the ones to do it. It's your family that are the ones to make you happy. So if all you're bringing is sadness and discord to your household, you can't expect them to turn around and bring joy and peace to you. So let's let God deal with that area of us, okay? Don't only be nice on the outside. 
You should be nicer on the inside to your family than you are on the outside. So whatever you're extending at the office, extend it at home. All right? Okay. Don't take your family for granted. Let's just put it that way. Verse 3. That is why I wrote as I did in my last letter, so that you will get things straightened out before I come. Then when I do come, I will not be made sad by the very ones who ought to give me the greatest joy. I felt sure that your happiness was bound up in mine, that you would not be happy either unless I come with joy. Verse 4. Oh, how I hated to write that letter. I, um, it almost broke my heart. And I tell you honestly that I cried over it. I didn't want to hurt you, but I had to show you how very much I loved you and cared about what was happening to you. Remember that the man I wrote about, remember that that man I wrote about who caused all the trouble, he has not caused sorrow to me as much as to the rest of you, though I certainly have had my share in it too. I don't want to be harder on him than I should. He has been punished enough by your united disapproval. Listen to this. Listen. Now it is time to forgive him and comfort him. Otherwise, he may become so bitter and discouraged that he won't be able to recover. Whenever you have to discipline someone in any fashion, whether you're a boss, whether you're a parent, whether you are um, a leader of a group, there may be times where you have to discipline or correct people. Don't have them feeling so discouraged that instead of coming back to God, they say, forget it. I'm just going to go out here and just, I don't even want to do this church stuff because they just as bad as the world. Yes, their correction does have to come at times. But listen, he said, okay, go back and comfort them. Let them know we still love you. Come on back in. We still love you. You just can't operate in that fashion. All right? Okay. Verse eight, please show him now that you still do love him very much. I wrote, now, now that makes me go back to them times when I was thinking when I was a little girl and I got in trouble and my mom had to give me a little a spanking and she would always say, now this hurts me more than it hurts you. And in my head, I'm like, you got to be kidding me if you think this hurts you. <laughs> oh, but she always would still extend love. And I, I didn't get as many. Most of the whoopings I got was because of my sister. She always got me into something. But to be honest with you, it, my mom always still showed love afterwards. And she didn't have to spank me that hard. She could hit me with a house shoe. And I promise you, my little feelings would have been hurt. <laughs> All right. Verse 9. I wrote you this as I did so that I could find out how far you would go in obeying me. When you forgive anyone, I do too. And whatever I have forgiven to the extent that this affected me uh, too has been by Christ's authority and for your good. A further reason for forgiveness is to keep from being outsmarted by Satan. So you know all those people that you're holding on to that you refuse to forgive? You are causing yourself to be outsmarted by Satan. He is using that as an opportunity to keep you bound. What? I'm going to read that again. Forgiveness is to keep from being outsmarted by Satan. For we know what he is trying to do. He is trying to bind us up with unforgiveness. Well, when I got as far as the city of Troas, the Lord gave me tremendous opportunities to preach the gospel. But Titus, my dear brother, wasn't there to meet me 
and I couldn't rest, wondering where he was and what had happened to him. So I said goodbye and went right on to Macedonia to try to find him. Now, to some that may sound a little strange, but you have to remember, they were um, they were in 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 a place where preaching the gospel, you could get killed for that. And so he was wondering where he was, where is Titus? Why, why haven't I been able to, to catch up with him? So he figured he was in Macedonia. He wanted to go see about his brother, all right? Verse 14, but thanks be to God for through what Christ has done. I'm sorry, yes, for through what Christ has done. <clears throat> he has triumphed over us so that now, Wherever we go, he uses us to tell others about the Lord and to spread the gospel like a sweet perfume. As far as God is concerned, there is a sweet, wholesome fragrance in our lives. It is the fragrance of Christ within us, an aroma to both saved and the unsaved all around us. People can smell the fragrance of God. To those who are not being saved, we seem a fearful smell of death and doom. While to those who are, are no Christ, we are a life-giving perfume. You see that? So to those that are like, I ain't got time for all that. I don't want to hear what you got to say. To, to them, our fragrance that's coming off is like death. Like, oh, I just don't even want to hear it. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to have nothing to do with it. But to those that know Christ, when we begin to speak about him, it is like a sweet smelling fragrance to them. My God. Wow. But who is adequate for such a task as this? Only those who, like ourselves, are men of integrity, sent by God, speaking with Christ's power, with God's eye upon us. We are not like those hucksters. <laughs> and there are many of them, just like nowadays. There's some hucksters out there. That I call it shenanigans. Whose idea in getting out of the gospel is to make a living out of it. You see that? Whose idea in getting out the gospel is to make a good living at it. There are many out here who are prophesying, prophet lying, prophet prophet, prophets for profit, preachers for profit, teachers for profit, teaching all kinds of stuff, selling all kinds of stuff, cash apps up all the time. Send me money, send me money, send me money. But if you ask them to pray for you, do you, do you get a response? Hmm. Okay, all right. They're just making a good living of it. That's it. They see the gospel as a cash machine. That's why you have to use discernment. <laughs> Believe that alone. Somebody gonna get mad. But you gotta use discernment. Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Are we beginning to be like those false teachers of yours who must tell you all about themselves and bring long letters of recommendations with them? I think you hardly need someone's letter to tell you about us, do you? And we don't need a recommendation from you either. The only letter I need is you yourselves by looking at the good change in your hearts. Everyone can see that we have done a good work among you. They can see that you are a letter from Christ written by us. It is not a letter written with pen and ink, but by the spirit of the living God. Not one carved on stone, but in human hearts. Let your recommendations come from the heart, the heart that God has changed. There are many of you all that are studying, you're praying, 
and you think that you can't be used of God because you don't have a degree, that is a lie. Who? God can use whomever from whatever background you have. He will fill you with wisdom. He will fill you with his anointing. He will fill you with his power and authority. That doesn't mean that just because those that have gone to school, they have their degrees, they have their masters and their doctors are not powerful. But some of you all keep uh, 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 um, uh, disqualifying yourselves. Don't do that anymore. It's God working through us. No matter if you have a degree or not, it's God working through you. Okay? We dare to say these good things about ourselves only because of our great trust in God through Christ, that he will help us to be true to what we say. And not because we think we can do anything of lasting value by ourselves. Our only power and success comes from God. Do you hear how Paul is trying to get the people of Corinth to understand everything that we do, any source of power that we operate from, any miracles that happen, any healings that happen, any manifestations that happen, they happen through God. Paul is making it plain. It's not, I'm not anyone. I don't have the power to do any of this. It's all through God. His power working through us. He is the one who has helped us tell others about his new agreement to save them. We do not tell them that they must obey every law of God or die, but we tell them there is life for them from the Holy Spirit. The old way, trying to be saved by keeping the Ten Commandments, ends in death. In the new way, the Holy Spirit gives them life. Yet, that old system of law that led to death began with such glory that people could not bear to look at Moses' face. For as he gave them God's law to obey, his face shone out with the very glory of God, though the brightness was already fading away. Shall we not expect far greater glory in these days when the Holy Spirit is giving life? If the plan that leads to doom was glorious, much more glorious is the plan that makes men right with God. In fact, the first glory as it shone from Moses' face is worth nothing at all in comparison with the overwhelming glory of the new agreement. So if the old system that faded into nothing was full of heavenly glory, the glory of God's new plan for our salvation is certainly far greater for it is eternal, my God. So for those that think that the only way that you're going to see God's face is by following the 10 commandments, he's letting you know right here, God gave us a far better plan in Christ Jesus, my God. Since we know that this new glory will never go away, we can preach with great boldness. And not as Moses did, who put a veil over his face so that the Israelis could not see the glory fade away. We can come boldly and talk about the goodness of God and talk about salvation and talk about the faithfulness of God and his glory will never leave us. You may not realize it, but people can see his glory all over you. You'll hear comments like, no, you shine. That You're glowing. That's the glory of God radiating through you. Not only Moses' face was veiled, 
but people's minds and understandings were veiled and blinded too. That's why at the top of every time we get ready to read, I ask that God open the eyes, unlock the ears so that you're not blinded. Even now, listen, when the scripture is read, it seems as though Jewish hearts and minds are covered by a thick veil because they cannot see and understand the real meaning of the scriptures. For this veil of misunderstanding can be removed only by believing in Christ. So if you're still struggling, trying to understand what the word is saying, it's because your heart is veiled. And the only way that you can understand this is in believing in Christ. Yes, even today, when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are blinded and they think that <laughs> and they think that obeying the Ten Commandments is the way to be saved. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord from his sins, then the veil is taken away. The Lord is the spirit who gives them life. And where he is, there is freedom from trying to be saved by keeping the laws of God. The laws of God were never meant to be the source of salvation. The laws of God actually show us the need for salvation because we can't keep the laws. Look, we can barely keep what 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tells us about how to operate in love. We, ba we barely keep that. Go back and listen to yesterday's broadcast. <laughs> we barely, I mean, we, we skeet you in there and try to keep that. You say, I keep the law of love. Okay. Are you rude to people? Are you impatient? Do you hold any grudges? Are you envious? Are you jealous? See, that all doesn't operate under the law of love. And we have a hard time keeping that on a daily. So how are you going to try to keep the Ten Commandments? All right, let's keep reading. But we believers have no veil over our faces. We can be mirrors that brightly reflect the glory of the Lord. And as the Spirit of the Lord works within us, we become more and more like him. And our last chapter for the day, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It is God himself in his mercy who gives us this wonderful work of telling his good news to others so that we never give up. We do not try to trick people into believing. We are not interested in fooling anyone. We never try to get anyone to believe that the Bible teaches what it doesn't. All such shameful methods we forego. We stand in the presence of God as we speak, so we tell the truth as all who know us will agree. Don't come up with trickery. Don't come up with some new method. Preach the gospel. Preach the word. That's it. It's not your theatrics that are going to cause people to know Christ. It's reading the word. Okay? If the good news we preach is hidden to anyone, it is hidden from the one who is on the road to eternal death. Satan, who is the god of this evil world, has made him blind, unable to see the glorious light of the gospel that is shining upon him or to understand the amazing message we preach about the glory of Christ, who is God. We don't go around preaching about ourselves. Wait, what? Let me read that again. We don't go around preaching about ourselves, but about Christ Jesus as Lord. All we say of ourselves is that we are your slaves because of what 
Jesus has done for us. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness has made us understand that it is the brightness of his glory that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. But this precious treasure, the light and power that now shine within us is held in a perishable container. That is <clears throat> in our weak bodies. Everyone can see that the glorious power within us must be from God and not our own. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but not crushed or broken. We are perplexed because we don't know why things happen as they do, but we don't give up and quit. We are hunted down, but God never abandons us. We get knocked down, but we get up and keep going again. These bodies of ours are constantly facing death, just as Jesus did. So it is clear to all that it is only the living Christ within us who keeps us safe. Yes, we live under constant danger to our lives because we serve the Lord. But this gives us constant opportunities to show forth the power of Jesus Christ within our dying bodies. Because of our preaching, we face death, but it has resulted in eternal life for you. My God, we boldly say what we believe, trusting God to care for us, just as the psalm writer did when he said, I believe and therefore I speak. We know that the same God who brought the Lord Jesus back from death will also bring us back to life again with Jesus and present us along with you. These sufferings of ours are for your benefit. And the more of you who are one to Christ, the more there are to thank him for his great kindness and the more the Lord is glorified. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our inner strength in the Lord is growing every day. These troubles and sufferings of ours, after all, are quite small and won't last very long. Whatever it is you're going through, yes, at this very moment, it seems traumatic. It seems huge. And to be honest with you, it probably is. But when Christ delivers you from that thing, you'll look back on it and you'll see it as minuscule and small compared to his glory. I can say that with a lot of things that have happened in my life. At, at the time that I was in it, it seemed huge. But now when I look back over it, it wasn't as big as I thought it was. At the moment, it was. But when God delivered me from that thing, he showed me that he was bigger than what I was dealing with. You see that? Yet this short time of distress will resort in God's richest blessings upon us forever and ever. So we do not look at what we can see right now, the troubles all around us, but we look forward to the joys in heaven, which are have not yet, I'm sorry, which we have not yet seen. The troubles will soon be over, but the joys will come and last forever. The joy to come will last forever. Thank you so much for joining us on our one year anniversary of reading the word of God together. We are in our 53rd book of 66 books of the Bible. And I know if God has been ministering to me as we read through the word, I know he's ministering to you also. He's transforming you. Even if you don't get on here every day and watch the replay. Just the one replay that you heard was the time God wanted you on because there may have been something you were dealing with 
And he's saying, look, daughter, look, son, I have a remedy. You haven't been in my word. And if you will get in my word, you will see I'm right there with you. I have a remedy. You're not the only one going through this. I hear you. I hear your cries. I hear you. I see your heart. You think he doesn't hear you, but he does. My God, Lord, let your people, let your people know that you are right there with them. No matter what they're going through, no matter what stage of life they're in, some are going into battles, some are coming out of battles, some are in the middle of battles. We thank you in every stage of life, you're right there with us. Some just had a loved one that transitioned on and their hearts are grieving. Be there, Lord God, hallelujah, to give them peace in this time of such great distress. Some are facing financial devastation. Show them that you are their provider. Some, their bodies are just revolting against the word. Hallelujah. Show them how powerful your word is. For your word says, by the stripes of Jesus, we are healed. Show them the strength of that word. Some, Lord God, have locked themselves up in cages. They got the key, but they won't turn the key. <laughs> they got the key, but it's more comfortable to be in the cage. Because in the cage, you get pity. And people come check on you. But God is saying, open the cage. I've got a lot to do through you. And if you're caged, you can't fly. If you're caged, my glory is hidden from the world. Unlock the door. You got the key. What is the key? Open it up. Say, Father, use me. I've been hiding from you. You think it's comfortable inside of that cage. Some of you all have run from God because you saw the call of God on your life and you don't think that you're able to do it. Did, did you forget that Paul used to kill the Christians? Did, did you forget that David killed a man so he could have the wife? Come on, did you forget about all the patriots and what they did? Go back and study it. Then you will see that the enemy has been lying to you. God can cover all that stuff in the blood as you bring it to God. Say, look God, I've been running from you and I've been running from you because X, Y, and Z, I did these things and I didn't think that you would use me. But as I read your word, I saw where they just came to you and you forgave them and you used them. So if you can forgive them, I know you'll forgive me. And you take whatever I did and you cast it into the sea and you don't remember it anymore. And since you don't remember it, neither will I. God can give you the ability to take that stuff and wipe it clean out of your mind. So that you can run and run in his strength and run in his authority and run in his power. You see that? So let the word transform you. Let the word renew you. Let the word refresh you. Let the word water you. Some of you are dry. You're parched. You know how the desert looks whenever it's dry and it's cracking? God is saying, let me water you so that everything comes back together again. Your vessel has been marred. Some of you are on the potter's wheel and you are swinging out of control, you think. But he's got you on that wheel. He's remaking you. <laughs> there were cracks and there were mars and he was like oh wait oh man let me remake him let me remake her and he's got you on that wheel and your life is spinning like this and you're like why he's remaking you 
Let him remake you. Because when you come out, you are going to be a vessel fit for the master's use. Some of us are in the fire and he's purging out everything that is not like him in our character, in our attitude. And all that dross is coming to the top and he's getting ready to wipe it all off. You're going to be a purified vessel. So we're all in different stages. It's okay. Just let this word work in your life. Apply it every day. When you see that you didn't do something, you go, ooh, I did do that too well, God. Look, let's be honest. You saw Paul was honest. He just said, you know what? We were overwhelmed. There are times when you're going to feel overwhelmed. Your emotions are going to come up. It's okay. Just let it all bubble out. And then go, all right, got it out, God. All right, let's keep going. That's what he's saying they did. They were in distress. They were fearful. They didn't know if they were going to make it out alive. You're not alone in the things that you're feeling. And you didn't even know all this was in the Bible. You only got whatever sermon you got on a Sunday or a Wednesday or a Tuesday Bible study. That's why it's important that you open it up and you read it yourself. Because you're going to see, oh my gosh, they're just like me. Yes, they are. And the power of God wants to rest in you just like it rested in the apostles and the patriarchs that we read about and the prophets that we read about. You see that? All right. Okay, guys. Well, we'll be back on tomorrow, which is Friday. We'll be back on and we're going to be reading 2 Corinthians chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8. It has definitely been a blessing Ah, I'm so glad I accepted this call to read the word of God with you all until we finish the entire Bible. We're not reading it as a Bible study per se, but we're reading it because many have never read the Bible in its entirety. You don't know what God has to say. You don't know how he responds. You don't know what moves him. You don't know what pleases him. You don't know what displeases him. All right? It's a blessing. It's a blessing. And it's a privilege to read the word of God and to walk in his power and his authority and in his glory and in his love and in his compassion and in his mercy. It's a blessing. All right? Okay, guys. I love you all. Don't forget to in the comments, put what scripture Holy Spirit was highlighting to you. I know I keep saying that, but write it in there because somebody else may be going, hey, that's the same scripture Holy Spirit highlighted to me, all right? So put that in the comments. Let us know what scripture you're gonna be meditating on and you're gonna be applying to your life, all right? Okay, guys, I love you all and we'll be back on tomorrow, Lord willing. Bye-bye and thank you again. For all you all who come on and share and have been coming on with us since we started doing this uh, Mar uh, one year ago. <laughs> one year ago today, we started reading the Bible together. And we are 52 books finished with uh, just a few more to go. Isn't that something? All right, guys. So we're going to be back on here tomorrow, Lord willing. I love you all. Don't forget to hit the share button and I'll see you tomorrow. All right. Bye-bye.